Hey guys, welcome back to Harbour Unboxed for part two of our March Q&A. We went a bit over time on the first one, so we've <laughs> decided to split it up and have another go at it. So hope you guys enjoy. All right, this is from YouTube. Do you think 5.25 inch drive bays are dead or will they make a comeback? Uh, I would say they're dead as a doorknob. <laughs> they're just way too big and nothing of usefulness, nothing useful yeah. uh, takes advantage of them. So yeah. They're gone. They're, they're, not, they're not making a comeback anytime soon. <laughs> Next question from YouTube. Which unboxing knife did you give to Tim? For a bit of context here, for those of you that don't watch unboxing boxes, shame on you. <laughs> <laughs> I got a new knife. So I had a crappy one and now I've got that beast for unboxing boxes. I'll keep a... my fingers away from that one, I think. <laughs> Definitely. And we got a second knife. They were both provided by Ted, who's a viewer. Uh, the second knife I was going to give to Tim, and I still plan to, but it turns out uh, it's a flick knife, and they are illegal here in Australia. But you can have the spring removed from them to legalise them. So I'm setting that off to a specialist because it's quite a difficult yeah, knife to take high apart. Quality yeah, as high well. quality knife. So they're hopefully going to be able to take that apart, remove the spring, and then Tim won't get locked up for possessing it. So that's the that's <laughs> the hope nice. anyway. Yeah. And if that fails and we can't get the spring removed, then our friends over at Sky Soldier Blade said they will hook us up with another knife that's legal. So bloody legends, those guys. Yeah, thanks to you all for uh, educating us in the comments a bit about the legality of some yeah. of these knives. We had not to knife look experts. Up some stuff. So, yeah. So yeah. anyway, it turns out we were wrong and <laughs> not legal. <laughs> so from YouTube again, how did hardware unboxed? What was the idea behind it? So I think. That question is uh, probably how did Harbour Unbox start or what yeah. was the yeah, idea behind so. it? Okay. Yeah. So I've, we've explained this once or twice or three times before, but I'll sort of quickly cover it again. The idea of this channel, as you guys know, Matt was the face of it originally. I started it with Matt and Matt's idea was because I get lots of hardware for the job I do at TechSpot, covering and reviewing computer hardware, was to unbox that stuff on the channel. Do that, make a video out of that, and then go and do the technical review. So we did one or two of those, and they turned out they were really boring, and we didn't even enjoy making them or watching them back, so we thought, well, this isn't going to work. And the natural progression seemed to be just pivoting into an extreme benchmarking <laughs> channel. So, Harbour Unboxed. Yeah, it's worked um, out. Yeah, we never changed the name, so yeah. But in keeping with our heritage, I unbox a heap of boxes that I collect and we do that once every week or two in unboxing boxes. So the name yeah. still makes sense. <laughs> All right, this next question is from YouTube. Is it safe to assume Intel will not make future CPUs compatible with its Z370 platform? I'm going to let you answer this one. There's a fear to use Intel's motherboards given their recent track record of releasing three different platforms in almost one year. Uh, thank you for all the hard work plus the hours you put into these videos. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks. Um, as far as Intel's support for future platforms on existing motherboards, um, yeah, probably not going to happen, is it? <laughs> Pretty much a guarantee, I would think, that yeah, yeah I... Intel don't like to support either forward or backwards compatibility with their motherboards at this point. Yeah, I don't think we're going to see anything change there unless Ryzen gets extremely, well, not competitive, it already is competitive, but takes an, an obvious lead. Uh, yeah. Then they might sort of change strategy a bit there. But yeah, I can't see anything changing anytime soon. So Adam on YouTube asks, are you a motorsport fan, Steve? What do you drive? Uh, well, yeah, I do enjoy motorsport quite a bit. I generally tune in for every F1 race. I don't like to miss any of those. Uh, as for what I drive... <laughs> not an F1 car, is it? <laughs> no, definitely not an F1 car. Um, these days, I just drive a Volkswagen Passat, and it's the diesel model because, you know, mileage and all that. Uh, but my first car was an R33. I've talked about it on the channel before in these Q&A things. It was pretty... I imported it from Japan myself way back in my early 20s. Uh, I had it for about seven years, and I did track it for the last few years that I owned it. It was fairly heavily modified, so it went really well, and it was a heap of fun. So, from YouTube, had a lot of questions from YouTube so far. Yeah, sorry about that. Why can't my Ryzen 1200 using a H115i can't do 4 gigahertz at 1.4 volts? Okay. Uh, well, it could just be that it's a bad chip, and even mm, if you're an expert overclocker, it just won't do it. 
or it could be your motherboard slash BIOS settings. I see a lot of people complaining about this, and I've found that most chips will do, you know, at least 3.9. Uh, most of mine do do 4 gigahertz with just under 1.4 volts. I found the key is increasing the load line calibration. That really helps stabilize and overclock. So if you're having some trouble there, check your load line calibration, see what that's set to, because you might be suffering voltage drop under load. So yeah, look into that. This next question is again from YouTube. Is it worth getting a pre-built in 2018? Yeah, so we see heaps of people talking about this and it really depends on the pre-built that you're talking about. Most of the examples out there, you know, pretty much junk. Mm, you yeah. know, really wouldn't want to touch it with a 20-foot pole. Uh, if it's a pre-built, it's really cheap, you know, it's probably for a reason. So you really need to look out there for, you know, the OEMs that give you actually good motherboards yes. and chips and power supplies and all that sort of thing. So keep that in mind. But I think, you know, the high-end gaming pre-builds tend to be pretty decent, but it just the cheaper ones got to... Yeah. yeah, really watch out for. As you say, it really depends on who is supplying them as well. So. Yeah. Next question is from YouTube, and it is addressed to Tim and I, but I think Tim will probably be more equipped to handle this one than I am. I wanted your opinion on the KB Lake G CPUs, and how many companies do you think will actually use them, since the 7700HQ uh, plus the 1060 or 1050 Ti combos already exist and are much cheaper than their supposed pricing? Uh, only one I've ever heard about is the XPS 15 2 in 1. Thanks and keep up the great content. Thank you. Yeah, so I'll answer that last part first. So um, there is the XPS 15 2 in 1 that's going to be using KB Lake G. There's also an HP Spectre X360 15 inch and I'm uh, and the NUC as well, of course, which is mm. not really a laptop, but yeah. Intel will be selling those. And I presume Apple as well has a bit of interest in these sort of chips, knowing that they often do Intel CPU mm. and AMD graphics in their laptops. I haven't heard about too much other interest, but that's where it kind of stands for at least the launch time frame. And I think uh, you know there will be some interest in it outside of that, but there's plenty of reasons to use it. The first one is that, you know, board space is really limited in these mm. platforms and cooling space as well. You know, if you have a discrete GPU and a CPU, you need more board space. You need a second fan often for the discrete GPU to be cooled and all that sort of thing. So, you know, companies yeah. are going to use it to save some of that. Yeah. Um, and assuming performance is around the level of a 1060, which is what it's sort of looking like uh, in terms of GPU, um, you know, that'll help bring better performance to thinner laptops, which I think, you know, we haven't seen too many of the 15 inches use a 1060 that aren't gaming laptops that are a bit thicker, whereas, you know, the Dell and HP models should be really thin and light. So there's plenty of reasons why companies will use it and hopefully we'll, you know, with the reduced space, we'll get better battery life in these systems. So it will be a win for a lot of people, but I think, you know, it'll be for higher products with that pricing difference. Yeah, plenty of possibilities there. So I'm yeah. sure there'll be plenty of companies wanting to take advantage of it. Yeah. So this is from Twitter. Will you do a Spectre slash Meltdown retest now that we've had time for the updates to be rolled out and finalized? Hmm. Yeah, okay. Um, I guess it depends on how much demand we've got, but at this point I'm thinking probably not. I'll just run benchmarks with everything up to date and present those results and we'll just move forward from there. But there's probably room for some sort of look back type video in the not too distant future. Next month will be busy though, so we'll see. This next question comes from Twitter. How much hardware have you unboxed? Well, not enough now that I have my new knife. So from Twitter, do you guys think RAM prices will ever go down? Uh, well, ever, yeah, kind of makes it yeah. easy to answer. Yeah, I'd say 100% they will go down. Uh, my crystal ball, though, it's giving me some conflicting data at this point. Uh, if I had to guess, though, I'd say pricing will start to really tumble uh, next year, or at least by next year at the latest. But, of course, don't hold me to that. As I said, my crystal ball isn't working at the moment. But hopefully that gives you a rough idea. Okay, this next question is from Twitter. Do you think there is a perfect laptop in terms of price, performance, design, etc.? Uh, yeah, probably not in terms of finding a perfect laptop. You know, a lot of laptops have at least some sort of, you know, small nitpick problem. Depends or issue. on what you want as well. Yeah, and it does depend what you want. You know, there are a lot of laptops I really like. I really like the Razorblade Stealth, mm. the Dell XPS 13, mm. those sort of laptops. So 
there are some really good options at the high end, but in terms of like the perfect system for price, performance, mm. and everything, uh, yeah, I think companies are still working to try find that. Yeah, definitely. All right, Steve, check out this question from Twitter. What's it like being a good source of benchmarks and things like that? Oh, that's nice. Well, good. <laughs> uh, seriously, though, yeah, we work hard to deliver the best content we can. So, yeah, it's great to have an audience, though, that appreciates the work we put into the videos. Uh, and because of that, I'd say it really feels like actual work. Yeah. So this question is also from Twitter. Will you give Far Cry 5 the honour of your legendary benchmark treatment? Ooh, you know it. I've pre-ordered it and I've already started warming up the test system, so we're good to go. This question's from Twitter. Since getting those knives, do you still have all your fingers intact? Yep, yeah, we're good. This next question is from Twitter. Uh, do you guys actually play the games or just use them for benchmarking? Tim, this is the second time someone has talked about playing games instead of just benchmarking them. What What is this all about? What are you guys talking about playing games? This one is from Twitter. Do you expect to see widespread USB-C and USB 3.1 Gen 2 front panel connectors anytime soon, or are we going to stay in this, wow, to USB 3.0? That's good, <laughs> hell for a while. Um, funny question. Uh, but I would expect this to become a standard feature, at least for higher-end cases. Uh, the Corsair, it's not actually behind me, it's normally behind me, so forget about that. The Corsair 500D that I recently checked out did have front uh, USB Type-C and 3.1 Gen 2 connectivity on the front panel. So I think we will start to see a lot more of that. So from Twitter again, do you think we are going to see more TI models in the 2000 series? TI models for us oh, for the next generation. Uh, probably only if AMD turn up the heat and force them to cover more price ranges. And I'm not I'm not ruling that out for the next generation parts. So they all yeah. probably think I'm a bit crazy, but we'll see what happens. All right, this next question comes from Twitter, specifically for Tim Shisa. That's your surname, isn't it? Yep, that's that's the correct way. Yep. I got a name right. That's yeah, not good. bad, not yep. bad. Uh, with the Razer phone having a 120 hertz screen, do you think the next big trend for smartphones are high refresh rate displays? So. Um, yeah, I I really hope so because we've seen that in PCs and it's awesome. Um, and hopefully that comes to a few more phones. But unfortunately, a lot of the releases I've seen so far, you know, from rumors and also you know, having devices, I've got a Galaxy S9 here, for example, um, they're bog standard 60 hertz. So mm. I think it's going to depend a lot on things like battery life and performance, which obviously need to be better for 120 hertz, you know, the display type and that sort of thing. So hopefully we see more, but I reckon a lot of phones will still be, unfortunately, still 60 hertz. Huh. Well, I'm going to say nothing because that was specifically just for Tim. So yep. moving on. Well, that does it for March's Q&A. Again, thank you to everyone who asked a question. <laughs> <laughs> yep. All right. I'm putting my phone into do not disturb mode. CZS. CZS laps. Uh, and that finally brings us to the end of the March Q&A. Thanks to everyone who asked a question. We had lots of questions to get through, and that's why we ended up splitting it into two parts. But I hope you guys enjoyed watching it, and we'll catch you again next time.